Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. I'm Pastor Jared, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. If you do not know, now you know we've moved our online broadcast to 9.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. Do us a favor and spread the word. Now, grab your Bible, grab your favorite cup of coffee, and let's dig into the word of the Lord. Welcome to part three of the Jesus people. We've been looking at the things that characterize the people who are the people of God, the Jesus people. And the first message, we talked about how that the Jesus people are empowered, and we talked about the Holy Spirit and how he does that. Last week, we talked about the filling of the Spirit and what exactly that means. Today's message is about how the people of God, Jesus people, are opposed. As we get started, please pray with me now. Father, this is your time. These are your people. I believe, God, that you're already here among us at work, that, God, you want this message to penetrate our hearts, our souls, our minds, so that we are prepared when the enemy attacks, when we are opposed, when those are, when it seems like the forces of the world seem aligned against us. Lord, you have given us the pattern. You've given us the way to fight from victory, not for victory. So I pray, God, today that we just be tuned into your spirit and what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's a quote I'd like to begin with by C.S. Lewis, and he said, one of the things that surprised me when I first read the New Testament seriously was that it talks so much about a dark power in the universe, a mighty evil spirit who was held to be the power behind death, disease, and sin. This is a universe at war. Simply put, creation looks like a war zone because it is a war zone. This world is far from being the loving, marvelous blueprint that God intended. Creation is now governed by powerful beings who resist God's purposes at every turn. Today, I want to teach you how to be victorious in this struggle because the Bible's clear. We've been given everything we need to be overcomers, to be victorious, to be winners, in the fight against this enemy, but everything begins with the acknowledgement that the enemy is real. C.S. Lewis also wrote this, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. So in the New Testament, Paul addresses how to engage in this conflict in his letter to the Ephesian church. If you've never read the book of Ephesians, you owe it to yourself to do so. This is a book that's first and foremost dedicated to helping you understand who you are in Jesus Christ. In the first three chapters, Paul tells us something amazing has occurred. You, you've been made brand new. You're completely and totally accepted by God. You've been redeemed. You have an eternal inheritance. You've been bought with a price, and the Holy Spirit has sealed you. Then in chapters five through six, he starts breaking down how this new life will begin breaking out in positive ways in all of our relationships. Specifically, he talks about our marriage and with our kids and even our employers. So he basically says, this is what happened. This is who you are. This is how you do it. And this is what it looks like. Then in chapter six, beginning in verse 10, he tells us, by the way, don't forget, this new life is going to be lived out in a hostile environment. You're going to be opposed because Jesus' people are opposed. You live in a fallen world, and in this fallen world, there is a real and powerful evil force that wants to take you out, wants to ruin your life, wants to ruin your marriage, your relationship with your kids, wants to split your church. His desire is to render you ineffective in your Christian walk so that the gospel itself is discredited and you become a miserable person, and you can't let that happen. So the first thing Paul feels compelled to address is what I call combat identification. Listen to how he describes it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Have you ever played one of those video games? They're called first-person shooter games where you're kind of hunting down bad guys in order to set a group of prisoners free. So you're working your way through some building or some maze of tunnels, and the enemy just keeps popping out, you know, behind corners, behind stacks of crates, and pretty soon 
you just start shooting anything and everything that moves. But that's a big mistake because every once in a while, one of those characters that pops out that surprises you is actually one of the people you're trying to set free. The last thing you want to do is mistake a prisoner for the enemy. Well, the same thing holds true in spiritual warfare. The last thing we want to do is mistake a prisoner for the enemy. Let me remind you again of what we just read. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Here, Paul is clearly describing a case of mistaken identity. Uh, Before you do battle, you have to be clear on who the enemy actually is. You see, sometimes we forget who we're fighting because sometimes people act like jerks and they do bad things. In other words, they're just like we were before we met Christ. They're prisoners. We're not at war with them. We're at war with the powers that hold them captive. Now, let me give you a little background on this letter that Paul wrote. Paul's writing this letter to the Ephesians from inside a prison while being chained to a Roman guard. It would have been easy for Paul to imagine that his problem was with that guard, or by extension the Roman government, or maybe even the Jewish leaders who were working to silence him by stirring up the Romans against him. But while all those people may have acted in evil ways, and even in opposition to the Apostle Paul, there's far more to evil than what you see on the surface. Whenever someone attacks me verbally, or my ministry is hindered in some way by some group or individual, something else is going on. Something bigger, something deeper, something far more sinister and more destructive than meets the eye. Paul's not saying that flesh and blood can't hurt you or hinder the cause of Christ, but his point is that the power behind those activities is greater than those who are unwitting pawns in his game. And if you don't understand that, then the battle's already lost. So Paul explicitly tells us we have an enemy, but we don't have an enemy in people. That's his point. And that's our greatest temptation, to treat people like they're the enemy. The other thing to keep in mind is this, the attack of the evil one is focused on making you forget who you are and whose you are. Satan's primary attack is on our identity and God's identity. The truth is many believers have a very shallow view of temptation. We think of temptation as the urge to do something we really want to do, but we know we shouldn't do. Just one more fling, one more drink, one more juicy rumor. Those may be temptations, but the greatest temptation is not the urge to misbehave. It's not the desire to do the wrong thing, but instead it's to be who we are not called to be. In the temptation of Christ, the devil wasn't tempting Jesus to misbehave. He wasn't tempting Jesus to steal a wallet, cheat on his taxes, or pick a fight with his neighbor. It was deeper than that. The devil was tempting Jesus to ignore his identity, to deny who he was and forget that he was the son of God. That's because in every temptation, Satan begins in exactly the same way. He begins by saying, if you're the son of God, the focal point of the attack was on the identity of Jesus Christ. That's what the devil does. He seeks to destroy our sense of who we are. So temptation begins with who you are, not what you do. The enemy tempts us to be someone other than who we're called to be, which makes temptation far more serious than merely committing some sin. The real temptation is to believe that I'm not a child of God and God really doesn't care about my needs. This is why Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians to remind believers of who they are in Christ. The first three chapters of this book are all about identity. The last three chapters apply those same principles to our relationships. Then the final thing that Paul talks about in Ephesians is how to stand against the attacks of the enemy. So now let me introduce you to what I call the weapons of our warfare. Here's what Paul wrote next. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm there with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, 
Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, to really get what Paul is saying here, we must first move beyond a Sunday school perspective on the armor of God. If you grew up in church or you ever taught children, it's hard not to think of the armor of God as a cute little Sunday school lesson where kids get to pretend to be a Roman soldier. But the armor of God has far more significance than simply to spark the imagination of a preschooler or a pastor. In fact, I think the most valuable teaching about the armor of God is neglected because we only treat it like it's a Sunday school lesson. The armor is all about being clothed in Jesus Christ. Each piece represents him. So the first three pieces of armor represent us in Christ, that Christ is the source of all truth, our righteousness, and our peace. That means the first three pieces of armor are always there. A soldier who's been going about their normal routine will typically be wearing their breastplate, their sandals, and their belt. It's a part of their daily attire. But when the soldier hears the call to battle, they don't run into battle with only their breastplate, belt, and sandals. That's when they remember to take up their shield, helmet, and sword. The last three pieces of armament are all about how we deal with specific situations we face, but they too represent Jesus Christ. St. Jerome, he was one of the early church fathers, he once wrote this, For what we read of the, from what we read of the Savior throughout the scriptures, it is clear that the whole armor of Christ is the Savior himself. It is he that we are to put on. So if you get nothing else I say today, get this. The armor is a symbolic description of Jesus himself. When the Bible tells us to suit up, it's telling us to put on Christ. That the armor is Jesus and what he has done and will do in each and every one of us. When Paul describes these various pieces of armament, he's saying we're to lay hold of Christ as our defense against the devil. F.B. Meyer once said it like this, there's only one way by which the tempter can be met. He laughs at our good resolutions and ridicules the pledges with which we fortify ourselves. Satan fears only one, he who in the hour of greatest weakness defeated him. Satan is not afraid of you, no matter how tough you talk, but he is afraid of Jesus. Now, as I already mentioned, there are two divisions or types of armor. If you're reading this passage in Ephesians 6, one thing stands out from the get-go. The tense of the verbs is different. So the first three pieces of armor are referred to in the past tense having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the equipment of the gospel of peace. In other words, if you're a Christian, you already have these things. That part's already done. So these are the things you and I have to remind ourselves that we have when facing the attack of the enemy. These are not things you have to acquire because they're already yours. So you remember them and you stand in the truth of them. The second division in the armor are all spoken of in the present tense. So these are the things that we have to take up at the moment of need. Taking the shield of faith, take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. Once again, they're yours, and you have complete access to each and every one of them, but that armament has to be taken up in the moment of need. So let me address how these things work in my next point that I'm calling Seeing Christ as Our Defense. Let's look at the various aspects of our armor one at a time, beginning with the belt. So Paul tells us, having girded your loins with truth. So get this, officers in the Roman army wore skirts similar to Scottish kilts or Jared's hoodie that he likes to tie around his waist. Over them, they had a cloak or a tunic, which, which they secured at the waist with a belt. When a soldier was about to enter battle, they would tuck their tunic up under the belt to leave their legs free, unimpeded, for the fight. That's what the Bible refers to as girding the loins. So girding the loins means you're ready to fight. That's why it's first. You can't do battle until you first know and understand the truth. The truth about the enemy, the truth about our commander-in-chief, but more importantly, the truth about who you are. So having girded your loins with truth is a metaphor. A Roman soldier had a belt, and on that belt, all the rest of the armor was attached. So the very first thing a Roman soldier would do is put on his belt because the rest of the armor depends on it. Of course, in the book of Ephesians, 
Paul has already told us the truth of who we are in Christ. He's already given us three chapters of truth. So what's true of you? You're accepted in the beloved. You've been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. You're part of God's family. You've been sealed with the Spirit. You belong to God. Then he tells us, you already have on the belt of truth. You just need to see yourself the way God sees you. Now, why does this matter? Because spiritual warfare always begins with truth because Satan always begins with lies. Satan is a liar. He's a deceiver. So he's going to lie to you. He's going to do everything in his power to make you doubt your standing, your new identity in Christ. He's going to remind you of your past, even though it's been forgiven. He's going to use guilt and shame to make you feel worthless and feel like you're never going to be anything other than what you've always been, even though the Bible declares boldly that you're a new creation in Christ. Now, one of the reasons that Satan is such an effective liar is because he's like a top-ranking defector from the CIA. He, he knows the protocols, the secret codes. He's got the lingo down cold. Therefore, he can be absolutely convincing when he lies. No one knows the Bible like Satan, and no one misuses the Bible like Satan. You might remember Martin Luther. He was the leader of the Protestant Reformation. He was in a deep depression and felt as if Satan himself were closing in on him. He said he heard Satan whisper in his ear, Martin, do you feel your sins are forgiven? And Luther rose to his feet and he shouted, no, I don't, but I know they are because God says so in his word. To combat lies, we need the truth, the truth of what God has said to us and about us. Friends, the battle is won or lost right here. At Scott Air Force Base in Belleville, Illinois, there's a sign that reads, an untrained soldier is just a target. That's what the enemy does. He's looking for easy targets. And that's what we become every time we go into battle, failing to understand who we are, who God is, and what we're really up against. Now, here's something else, the breastplate. Paul writes, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the breastplate was made of bronze, or if you were a more affluent soldier, it could even be chain mail. It was worn from just below the neck and extended down to the thighs. It was often referred to as the heart protector for obvious reasons. So Paul refers to it as the breastplate of righteousness. So let me ask you, how do you and I become righteous? Well, the Bible declares that Christ has made me righteous. I'm accepted by God because of what Christ has done. If you have on the breastplate of righteousness, then your heart, your emotions are securely guarded and adequately protected against attack. This is the area most frequently attacked in my Christian faith, my standing with God. Guilt and shame, they come along and they're soul killers. When we're under attack, we start feeling like we're a failure and that God's going to reject us. We feel guilty. Our conscience makes us miserable. We think God blames us because that's how Satan attacks. How do you answer an attack like that? Well, you put on the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, you don't stand on your own merits. You never did. You gave all that up when you came to know Christ. You quit trying to be good enough to please God. You come to him on the basis of his righteousness, the righteousness he gives to you. You begin your Christian life that way, and you continue in that way. When Christ is your righteousness, you know it's not your behavior or lack of behavior that makes you acceptable to God. This is what Paul was saying in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. You're believing a lie when you believe that God's angry with you, that he rejects you. By the grace of God, I am what I am. What I am is what Christ has made me to be. I'm not standing on my own righteousness. I'm standing on his. So I can boldly say, get away from me, Satan. I'm not going to listen to that trash. I reject those thoughts. Now, how different would life be if you stopped beating yourself up all the time? How different would life be if you knew you were fully forgiven and fully loved? How different would life be if you knew there wasn't even the slightest condemnation coming from the heart of God in your direction. Well, let me tell you something. If you're a child of God, there is no reason to beat yourself up. You are fully forgiven and fully loved, and there isn't the slightest bit of condemnation coming from God towards you. My question for you is, when are you going to start living like the truth is true? 
Temptation's battleground is not first and foremost another drink or lustful thought or taking something that doesn't belong to you. The first temptation is to forget who you are and whose you are. Getting you to fall is easy after that. So Satan attacks our identity. The armor of God is about standing on your identity in Christ because that's your only defense. Then there's the sandals. Paul writes, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shoes are absolutely essential to fighting. Imagine a barefoot soldier, a soldier clad in armor from his head to foot, but with no shoes. How quickly would the rough terrain tear up his feet? Despite the fact that they had all the equipment they need, they would be rendered unfit to fight. A soldier's sandals in those days often had knobs on the bottom or sometimes even nails. It's been said that Alexander the Great invented these, or at the very least, he championed these sandals because they had that extra gripping power, so it made his troops fight from a firm foundation. According to Paul, our firm foundation is our understanding of the gospel. So what does this mean? Well, again, it's Jesus. Christ is our peace, our sense of well-being. That's where we stand. Now think about the relationship of these first three pieces of armament to one another and the importance of the order. The first piece tells us that Christ is the truth, the ultimate source of reality. And then what? Well, when we know him as truth, we don't stand on our own merits, we stand on his. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We stand on the basis of what he's done, not on what we do. And what's the result of that? Our hearts are at peace. Our foundation is strong. That's why it's so important to remember that you don't start with peace. When attacks come, don't try to make your heart feel peaceful. Start with truth. Christ is the truth. When you face the truth and remember his righteousness, then you'll have peace. So those are the first three pieces of armament. And you can clearly see how they're symbolic of Jesus Christ in us, what he's already given to us, what he's already done. If you're a Christian, you've already put these things on. But when you're under attack, you have to remind yourself that they are yours because the enemy wants to make you forget that. So if those are the things that describe what we are, these next three pieces of armor are things we have to take up. So first comes the shield. Listen to how Paul describes it. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. A standard Roman shield was almost as big as a door. It measured about four feet by two and a half feet. It was usually made of wood, but was typically covered on the surface with some sort of metal and sometimes leather, so it could more easily deflect the enemy's arrows and projectiles. Oftentimes, when the Roman army fought, they came together in such a way that the shields would overlap, transforming the unit of soldiers into something that looked more like an armored tank. So what is the shield of faith? What does that mean to us? Well, the definition of faith is our absolute confidence in God, his promises, his power, and his program for our lives. This is all about claiming God's promises, trusting God's character, and applying God's truth. Because listen to this, faith is acting on our beliefs. It's taking general truth and applying it to our specific situation. That's what the shield of faith is all about. So faith is acting on the truth of who I am in Christ. I am not condemned. I am forgiven. I have everything I need in him. He's my belt of truth. And he's my breastplate of righteousness. I don't stand on my own merits. I stand on his, which leaves me with my foundation of peace. The shield is acting on those beliefs to act like the truth is true. Then comes the helmet. So Paul says, and take the helmet of salvation. So this next piece of armor Paul tells us to take up is the helmet of salvation. A helmet clearly is designed to protect the head, to protect the mind. You need to understand the battleground where most of our spiritual warfare is happening is going on in our mind, in our thinking. So the helmet of salvation is intended to protect us from Satan's attacks on our thought life. But how does this piece of armor differ from the breastplate of righteousness? After all, salvation and righteousness seem to be fairly closely linked. Well, it's probably helpful to consider the three tenses of salvation. When you talk about salvation, we talk about it as being past, present, and future. So there's a sense in which salvation is something that's been done in the past, something that's already occurred. 
we made our peace with God. He saved us. We crossed the bridge of faith, settled the fact that Christ is our leader and forgiver. So salvation is past. But salvation is also present. That is, we're also in the process of being saved. The term for this is sanctification. In other words, God's not done with us yet. The good work he began, he's continuing to do. God is constantly scraping off the rough edges, maturing us, refining us, purifying us so that we're becoming more and more like Christ. In fact, I mentioned this last week, the Holy Spirit is God's earnest money, money that he deposits into your life and mine as a down payment to demonstrate his resolve to finish what he started in you and me. But there's another sense in which salvation is not yet complete. That is, until we stand face to face with Jesus. We're not there yet. The Bible calls this aspect of salvation our hope, a hope that looks ahead to the day when Satan is utterly defeated, when there'll be no more crying, no more pain, no more struggle with sin. That's the hope that we're to take up, the hope that motivates us and helps us remember the final outcome when all the world appear around us appears to be going to hell. It's this hope that keeps us from that keeps us going, even when from time to time we suffer a loss in battle because we know the war's already been won. That's our helmet of hope. Now, I don't know about you, but it just seems the more I watch the news, the more easily I can get overwhelmed. It all gets to feeling like it's just too much. And that's when I have to remember that I can't allow the present moment and the details of this moment to overwhelm the bigger picture that God has given us in his word. God will get the final word and it will be good. This is our salvation hope. It's ultimately about remembering that even though we may lose a battle or two in this life, the war is already won. Now, you might remember the story of the doomed Titan mission. The Titan was a privately operated submersible that imploded on June 18th of this year while transporting tourists to visit the wreckage of the Titanic, killing everyone on board. Ultimately, it was decided that the composite material out of which the sub was made was not able to handle the repeated exposure to the tremendous pressure that such depths exerted on the hull of the sub, causing it to implode. But you know what's amazing? Certain species of fish can and do live at those depths and move about effortlessly. You might think that those thin-skinned creatures would just be crushed by the weight of the water, much like that submersible. But they're not, simply because they have within themselves an equal and opposite pressure. When we face the pressure of the world and all its temptations, we don't need to try to protect ourselves with thick steel walls. We just need to have an equal and opposite pressure inside us, the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's one more final piece of armament, and that's the sword. Paul describes it like this, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, this sword isn't a big, long, heavy sword like what you might remember from the movie Braveheart. This is a two-foot sword that's used for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Word of God is our sword. It's, it's interesting. There, there are two words for word in the Bible. One is logos, which is the fullness of God's communication with us. And the other is rhema, which is the spoken word or words given to us by the Spirit in the moment so that we can do close hand-to-hand -hand combat with the lies and deceptions of the enemy. Paul is saying that we're to use the truth of God's word quoted and applied to the specific lie and deception that we're facing. That's the sword of the Spirit. So to have on the full armor of God, you have to be a man or woman of this book. You have to begin to master this book. You need to read it in such a way that it becomes a part of who you are and your mind is renewed. When Jesus was assaulted by the tempter in the wilderness, he quoted five times from the book of Deuteronomy. How would you do against temptation if it was dependent on your knowledge of the book of Deuteronomy? He quotes scripture and he defeats the enemy. That's how you take up the sword of the spirit. We have to know the word and feed on it. You know, one of the characteristic of every writer in the New Testament is their thorough knowledge of the word of God. Paul quotes and paraphrases the Old Testament 183 different times. John, in the book of Revelation, there's 404 verses in that book, and he quotes the Old Testament more than 500 times. What I'm saying is simply this. Spiritual warfare begins with spiritual welfare. Satan always exploits the places in our life that we neglect, which is why the devil's main strategy has always been to make you forget who you are and whose you are. 
Satan attacks our identity as the children of God because who you are in Christ is something revealed to us in his word. And if you don't know the word, you don't know who you are. The devil's attack is always focused on identity. Before you sin, the first temptation will always be to say, God doesn't love me and God doesn't have my best interests at heart. Because if we were convinced that God loved us and had our best interests at heart, we would always do it his way. Some of you might remember this story of the ancient, uh, from ancient history of the Thracian slave by the name of Spartacus. He led a very successful uprising of slaves against Rome. Spartacus defeated the Roman army seven times before he was finally defeated by the Roman general Marcus Crassus in 71 BC. Now, what's most interesting about Spartacus' story is at first he started with a very small band of slaves that were being trained as gladiators. Rome paid little attention to him because it was thought that even a small force of Roman soldiers could easily defeat him. Yet with smaller numbers, Spartacus consistently defeated larger forces. Do you know why? Because Spartacus learned to attack late at night or early in the morning when the enemy was not prepared to do battle. He attacked when they didn't have their armor on. The enemy is looking for believers who are unprepared for battle, for believers who don't know who they are and whose they are. So now that Paul has explicitly told us what it means to put on the armor of God, you half expect him to say, now that you've done everything you need to be victorious, get out there and fight, advance, charge. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't say anything even remotely like that. Instead, he reminds us that we're fighting from victory, not for victory. That's the good news. As believers in Christ, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We're not trying to win. We've already won. We fight from victory. In the power of Christ, we are invincible. Listen to what John tells us in 1 John 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That's a fact. Or how about this? For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So Jesus says to all of his children, everything you need to defeat the enemy, I'm putting at your feet. Now I want you to take it up. I want you to fight from that standpoint. Then Paul adds this, and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. Stand firm. In other words, hold on to what you possess. Because darts are going to come, and lies are going to come, and people are going to come, and circumstances are going to come to tell you you're not worthy, you don't have peace, God doesn't love you. The enemy's strategy is to encroach and encroach and encroach until how you live and how you think looks like how you used to live and how you used to think and how you used to treat people. Imagine a football team defending this goal line. The defense lines up on the scrimmage line and does what's called a goal line stand. They refuse to be moved. That's the picture that Paul is painting. We're to refuse to give even one inch of the ground that Christ has fought and died to take for you. We refuse to yield. So this is a defensive action. I know you grew up hearing, just like I did, that the best defense is a good offense. But the Bible teaches when it comes to temptation, the right defense will win the day. Our battle is a defensive one, not an offensive one. When it comes to temptation and the attacks of the evil one, we're to defend what is already ours. In, in, in this uh, Christian battle, the offensive work, that was accomplished 2,000 years ago by Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the only one who has the power to take this offensive or take the offensive in this battle with the Prince of Darkness. In fact, he already did it. Everything we have and everything we need as believers has been given to us. We don't have to fight for it. We don't have to do battle to be saved. We don't have to fight to be justified or be forgiven or accepted into the family of God. All these things are given to us. They've been won by Jesus Christ. We're to hold on to what God has given us and not let any of it be lost or taken away. To contend for the faith doesn't mean to attack everyone who doesn't agree with you. It means to hold on to what God has already given you and utilize it to the full. Never surrender an inch of ground to the enemy that Jesus Christ conquered for you. Whenever any believer 
even the newest and weakest believer, stands in the strength of Christ, puts on the whole armor of God, in other words, puts on Jesus, and takes his stand on what God has said, the devil is always defeated. You know, in December 1944, Allied forces, after making amazing advancements, had slowed in their advancement toward Germany. Low cloud cover and fog hampered the use of Allied air superiority. Hitler believed he had an opportunity to divide the British from the American troops by exploiting a weakly defended area near the heavenly wooded Arden Forest. So on December 16th of that year, he amassed his troops and then attacked. The U.S. High Command didn't realize at first that this was a major offensive and not just a skirmish. But they quickly determined that the area around Bastogne was the key to stopping the German advance. The commanding general ordered the 101st Airborne under General Anthony McAuliffe to move into Bastogne and hold it. The 101st Airborne succeeded in occupying the town, but shortly thereafter were completely surrounded by enemy troops. As an airborne division, they had very little artillery, and after fierce fighting, all their ammunition was running out. Because the weather remained so bad, it hindered all resupply air efforts by airdrop. Medical supplies were also running out, so the wounded could no longer be treated. Now imagine yourself as a soldier in that situation. The coldest winter in Europe in 50 years. Fog so thick both the Germans and the Americans didn't even know where the battle lines were. Many of your buddies having been killed or wounded. Supplies running out. And regular propaganda leaflets were being dropped to tell you to just give up and warm food was just 300 yards away. A delegation of German soldiers approached the American troops carrying a white flag. This was their message. There's only one possibility to save your troops from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of this town. If this proposal is rejected, the German artillery with six heavy battalions stand ready to annihilate the U.S. troops in Bastogne. What would you have done in that situation? How did General McAuliffe respond from the 101st Airborne? With one word reply. It's actually the shortest quotation in Bartlett's familiar book of quotations. He sent the Germans one word, nuts. The Germans were so confused when they received this reply that they had to ask what it meant. But here's what you need to know. General McAuliffe saw the big picture. Now, he didn't know if he would be rescued or not, but he knew the role his division had to play in the overall scheme of things. He was to hold Bastogne at all costs, to make his stand, to not yield one inch of ground to the enemy. And that's our marching orders as well. Hold your ground. Don't yield even so much as an inch to the enemy that Christ has already won for us at the cross. Now, had you been a soldier in that situation, you might not have been able to see the bigger picture. You might not see how that cloud cover would break and supplies would soon be dropped. You might not even know that at that moment, General Patton, General Patton was on his way. And no one in that little town of Bastogne knew that within six months, Hitler himself would be dead and the war would be over. You got to remember that no matter what appearances may be, the outcome of the struggle in which we're engaged is certain. God has already been victorious and will ultimately defeat all evil. The end is certain. The outcome is sure. The battle is the Lord's. It is not ultimately a struggle between us and the devil, but a struggle between Christ and Satan, and he already won that. He's a defeated foe. In other words, he's just out on bail right now. His ultimate sentence to the lake of fire has only been postponed, but the verdict has already been read. Now, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, but you feel constantly defeated, you question your worth, you time after time, you, you mess up and you beat yourself up relentlessly, then you're letting the lies of the past and the lies of the enemy have more power in your life than the truth that God has spoken. What's the actual truth about you? Paul told us in the book of Ephesians, you're accepted in the beloved. You've been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. You're part of God's family. You've been sealed with the spirit. You belong to God. That's the truth no matter what you might think or what the enemy might say. Unless and until you start believing the truth, you will always be defeated. You know what I've learned to say to myself? My father is very fond of me. I say that to myself all the time because it's truth. And I want to live out the truth, not the lies. Here's what I know and what Paul is saying to us right now. Whatever your ID badge says about you, that's what you're going to live out. You're going to, be, you're going to live like 
what you believe you happen to be, what you are. That's why the spiritual battle is always first and foremost an attack on identity. That's the question that you and I have to settle in life. Am I going to live by my old ID badge or the new one that I have in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for the message of the book of Ephesians. How Paul spends three entire chapters just laying out so clearly and carefully that we have a brand new identity and a new standing in Jesus Christ, that that is in fact who we are. And that when the enemy comes against us, he's always first and foremost going to attack who we are. And if we don't know who we are, if we're still living by our old ID badge, if we're still living by the lies we were told by others, the lies we tell ourselves, and the lies that the enemy gives us about ourselves, then we will never truly be victorious. The victory was won by Jesus Christ. The land that we stand on, this ground upon which our feet are planted, was won by Jesus. And he says, yield not an inch of that land to the enemy. This is who you are. This is who I made you to be. This is what I want you to know about yourself, that I am very fond of you. And so God, help us to fight from victory, not for victory. Help us to know that Jesus has already won this battle and that God, we win in his power. So God, let us be clothed with Jesus Christ. Help us to stand in your truth about what you've said. Help us to know, God, that it's the breastplate of righteousness, your righteousness, that makes us acceptable and that we have peace. Help us, God, to take up the shield of faith, to, to believe and to practice like this truth is true. Help us to remember that we have a helmet of hope that tells us and reminds us that ultimately, Lord, that you've already won the war and that's a settled fact. And that, God, we take out the sword of your spirit, the the word of God, your truth that you've said about us to combat the lies of the enemy. And when we do that, God, we are victorious. So God, for anyone who's feeling down, beat up, continues to, every time they mess up, to jump on themselves with both feet, to recriminate themselves, to move into guilt and to shame and their conscience has a heyday, God, help them to begin to live like the truth is true. Help them, God, by spending time in your word and reminding themselves of what you've said about us, that your truth is greater than the lies we tell ourselves, that your truth is greater than the lies the enemy says about us, that your truth is the truth we want to live because only the truth will set us free. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We appreciate Every time that you join us on a weekend service, whether you're live or in person like this on our weekend, we are just so grateful that you would choose to be a part of this and be a part of our church family. Continue to stay with us for the rest of this series. We're going to wrap up next week and talk about how God's people, that the Jesus people, are difference makers. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. I pray it's a great week. <music>